We are on now to Luke 18, verse 18. And you may recall, uh, on the Friday before Holy Week, um, that I did a little intro on this, so I'm not going to belabor this. I'm just going to point out one thing that I did mention uh, back then, which is that here, this ruler, who is not identified uh, as he is, you know, he's identified as a young ruler. He's identified immediately as rich in Matthew's gospel. We don't find out about his financial status until further along in Jesus' encounter with him here in Luke. But um, the word that's used here, um, the standalone word ruler, would seem to indicate that this is a, a civic official. This is not uh, a ruler of the synagogue. You know, otherwise it would have mentioned it as it did specifically of the synagogue ruler who approached Jesus in Luke 10, 25. Um, so this, this seems to be a civil authority of some sort. And um, given the context and given his response, it's fair to say that he is a Jewish civil ruler. So he may be in the pay of the Romans, or he may be part of this uh, puppet regime of Herod, who would have had his own officials in various locations as well. So this is a person who's accustomed to giving orders and having them obeyed, and who also thinks of himself clearly as we get into this as a good practicing Jew. So let's uh, get into this encounter between Jesus and this, <clears throat> this man, and uh, then we'll unpack it. And a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, What is impossible with men is possible with God. And Peter said, See, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Now there's a lot there. And for those of you who were involved with the Matthew study, this will sound familiar. Uh, Luke uh, tells it somewhat differently and in accordance with his own themes. But this is paralleled in the Gospel of Matthew. I meant to uh, uh, publish the uh, parallel uh, in the comments tonight and forgot to do that. But there are some very specifically Lucan things here that uh, we'll uh, call attention to. The first thing to mention is that we have another one of those inclusios or inclusions that I've talked about. An inclusio or an inclusion, as you remember, is a block of scripture. It can be long or it can be short. 
that begins with a particular word or a particular theme and then ends with that particular word or particular theme or concept. And that means that everything in between it has something to do with that concept, word, or theme. Well, here we have an inclusio, uh, not surprising, I suppose. Um, it begins in verse 18. You see the, the phrase eternal life, and it shows up again in verse 30. So um, most uh, editions of the New Testament will set this incident off like that anyway. But of course, when Luke originally wrote it, we didn't, he didn't have verses and all of that. Um, so an inclusio would be a signal to a reader or a hearer that uh, a person ought to attend to what was in between there that related to those uh, bookend terms. So, you know, I think it's easy to come away from this um, incident and think, oh, it's about money and it's about possessions. In fact, what it's really about is eternal life and not allowing anything to get in the way of our apprehending that gift from God. Now, of course, the thing that is preventing this man, we'll see in the middle of the passage, from apprehending or taking hold of this free gift is his idolatry of money, uh, his love of money, and uh, he can't part with it, and that's a problem. Um, you've heard me quote Luther before when he said, whatever is most important to you is your God. Well, clearly for this man, what is most important to him is his money. He wants eternal life. He wants it. You can't serve two masters. That doesn't mean that it is intrinsically wrong for people to be wealthy. Some people are blessed with wealth. But as with all blessings that we receive in this life, they are to be held on to loosely. Um, I think of this, and I've told this story, I mentioned the story uh, maybe just last week or week before last, about the friend of ours who had the daughter who had died um, of leukemia and then had another child nearly die in a drowning incident. And in the midst of that, God seemed to say to her, you shall have no other gods before me. She had made her children her gods. Even our children, as much as we love them, we must hold on to them loosely. That doesn't mean we don't love them and won't do for them and all of that. Uh, that's all true. You never stop being a parent. But we also don't want to do anything that stilts our children, that prevents them from uh, growing up, right? Um, and um, maturing and living life. So um, our children are trusts for we who are parents. Money is a trust given to us, whether it's a large amount or a small amount, and so on and so forth. So this whole uh, block of scripture deals with the desire for eternal life and what is preventing this man from apprehending this gift that is freely offered in Christ. Now, I may have pointed out the other day um, uh, when we met last that his question is very much like the question asked in Luke 10, 25. What must I do to inherit eternal life? The emphasis is on what acts must I perform in order to be worthy of eternal life? Now, Jesus plays into this question, as we'll see here in just a second. But in the end, you're left with the idea, actually, there's nothing I can do. This is a matter of what God does for me. And for me to receive this gift freely offered, I must let go of what prevents me from taking the gift. And this is what's meant by daily repentance and renewal. 
we must daily turn away from those things that prevent us from following Jesus and receiving the life that he freely gives. Um, and here we're talking about sin and, um, uh, you know, our idolatries. And I've mentioned before that every sin that we commit, um, you know, violating uh, commandments two through ten, are truly also a violation of the first commandment of having uh, not having other gods before the one true God of the world. And why I say that is that when we chase after these things, they can actually become our gods, uh, money sex, uh, uh, you know, trampling on the reputations of others to build ourselves up with gossiping. Um, but there is also an underlying idolatry. It may be an idolatry of ourself or an idolatry of the thing pursued, but there is always a violation of the first commandment that goes with it. If for no other reason, then we are supplanting God's judgment and God's will with our own judgment and our own will. You see how that works. So uh, the man wants to find out what he must do. This is works righteousness. And we know from the whole scripture, there is nothing that we can do to inherit eternal life. Jesus said to Nicodemus, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. It's a matter of turning trustingly uh, to the God we know in Jesus. And, of course, my favorite uh, kind of passage on this is where Jesus simply says, The work of God is this, to believe in the one who, whom he sent to believe in Jesus. So the man's question is cockeyed in the first place. What must I do? But it's a typical kind of idea in the human race, right? Uh, the whole world kind of operates in this way. What, what do I have to do to get ahead? <clears throat> get ahead. What do I have to do to uh, be successful? What do I have to do to make my relationships work? Et cetera, et cetera. And we put ourselves on this uh, uh, merry-go-round of proving ourselves all the time, which is why Jesus' words in Matthew are so welcome. Come to me, all of you who are weak and heavy, weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's what Jesus wants to do. We live in perpetual Sabbath rest with him. Nothing to prove. He's proven everything for us. Now we're free to live our lives fully. That doesn't mean we don't have ambitions uh, or try to succeed in life or try to better ourselves. You know, we want to uh, fulfill our purposes in li life. We want to uh, make the best of our lives, of course. But uh, we must not mistake that for proving ourselves to God. We've been freed from that dog-eat-dog -dog mentality. We are free to live. By the gospel. So now, it, it, here's this question, what must I do? And then he asks about eternal life. Now, we talked before about how uh, the Jews of that time did not universally believe in the existence of eternal life. And um, we talked about how the, the Pharisees believed in eternal life. The Sadducees did not. And it was, had been for many centuries, a kind of minority opinion. When you look in much of the Old Testament, they talk about people going down to Sheol, the place of the dead. It took a while for the Jewish people to understand that God was um, eternal and wanted to restore us e to eternal life. The eternal life for which Adam and Eve had been created. And we see this in several places in the Old Testament. I'd like to show you. First of all, one of my favorite passages, Job 19, verses 25 to 27. Take a look at that. Job 19, 25 to 27. Now remember, the Psalms are in the middle of your Bible, and Job is the book right before the Psalms to help you find that. Job 19, 
25 to 27. Here is Job, who has, by the way, in the course of this book, given expression to that other understanding of people going down to Sheol and in Sheol, the place of the dead, not being able to uh, praise God or um, uh, offer him uh, worship. Um, uh Jenny, I think you just tried to call me on Facebook. I think, I, and I hear my phone still buzzing for that. So I think that's what you were trying, uh, you must have hit something accidentally there. Um, so anyway, but Job also, despite uh, what he's going through, you know, Job went through so much and felt that he got terrible things he did not deserve, which is true. Uh, just a moment. My phone is still buzzing. Just a second. Okay. Um, he thought he, he was afflicted with all of these things that he did not deserve. And he shook a fist at God. And we talked about this before, that God is big enough to take our shaking fists. And um, you don't get angry with a God you don't believe is there, right? So that the very act of complaining to God or being aggravated or angry with God is indicative of faith, you believe that God exists and you can reach out to him and talk with him. So uh, we see this kind of healthy faith in uh, Job. Um, although as he's provoked by his friends trying to explain away Job's suffering in a way that built themselves up and made Job feel like he had to defend his own righteousness, uh, God finally says, to Job at the end of it, where were you when I created the world? In other words, there are just some things that are too mysterious for us to understand. But take a look at Job 19, 25 to 27, and look at this expression of resurrection faith on the part of Job. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, Yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. So Job is expressing a belief in life beyond this time-bound, death-bound world. He's expressing a belief in eternal life. <coughs> now, Daniel is the Old Testament book that makes this even more explicit. Take a look at Daniel 12, verse 2. Daniel 12, verse 2. I'm getting there. It says, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So this particular Jewish man <coughs> believes that there is an eternal life. He's part of that strand of Judaism that believes it. And he asked Jesus, what must, must I do? Now, Jesus' response is interesting. <clears throat> and there's a little bit of snapping here, if you will. In verse 19, Jesus says to the man, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Um, Jesus is making a point here. Um, 
Why do you go around calling people good when you know that only God is good? This is very important because uh, while the man <coughs> may have had good intentions, good intentions here, it's clear that he regards Jesus as nothing but a teacher and nothing more, but he uses the term good. And Jesus basically says to him, don't throw that term around unless you mean it. And the other thing that Jesus seems to be saying here is, I am good <laughs> because I am God. Is that what you mean? Well, right, right off the bat, they're, they're getting off on the wrong foot from the standpoint of the ruler here. So then Jesus comes back and because this man is interested in performance, he says, you know, the commandments do not commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor your father and mother. Notice that he uh, honor your father and mother, which is the fourth commandment he puts at the end of this list. All of, <coughs> man, <coughs> I've got a frog and a tickle that won't go away. Um, all of these are commandments that appear in the second table, uh, which deals with our relationship with other people. Well, the man is quite confident and also, I think, a little bit offended by the fact that Jesus has come back and said, why do you call me good? Because the response that Jesus gives to this kind of not very well biblically informed idea. After all, Abraham believed and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Justification was always a matter of faith, not of works, not what I do. So Jesus throws the commandments back at the man. Now this is important. Uh, for a person to understand who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for them and for them to truly apprehend the life that he gives to them, they must be confronted with both the law and the gospel. So what Jesus does is uh, he says to the man, okay, uh, you want to know what you have to do. Here's the law. Now, anyone who understands the full implications of these commandments, do not commit adultery which Jesus will, you know, has explained. Uh, if we look upon a person lustfully, we've committed adultery. Do not murder. If we, if we think hateful thoughts about someone, we've committed murder. Do not steal. If we've coveted, we've stolen. Do not bear false witness. If we've gossiped, we've borne false witness. If, you know, and on and on. In other words, uh, what Jesus comes back to the man with is, okay, you're into performance religion. Here are the commands. Here are the laws. How are you doing? How are you doing with those? Honesty should have compelled the man to say, oh, I'm in trouble because I haven't perfectly kept the commandments of God. Instead, he thinks, well, Jesus is giving me this, you know, uh, two-year-old or four-year-old Sunday school answer. And he said, I could have gone to any, any kid uh, who'd spent any time in the synagogue and gotten this answer. So he says in verse 21, all these I've kept from my youth. Now, that is, that's pretty amazing. Um, and, but, you know, we shouldn't be too hard on him because sometimes when, when we hear God's law, we think, well, I'm not that bad. And we, you know, we'll compare ourselves to, I don't know, Hitler. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll grade ourselves on a curve. Well, the law doesn't allow for a curve. The law confronts us with the reality of our sin and our need for a Savior and a Redeemer. 
So if the man had been truly honest with Jesus, he would have said, I failed on these. How may I receive eternal life? Uh, but instead he says, I've kept these from my youth. Uh, and then, verse 22, when Jesus heard this, he said to them, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Now here, Jesus is giving him law and gospel. He, Jesus, because he's God, understands the peculiar idolatries of this man. He understands the particular things that prevent this man from having eternal life. And in this case, it's his idolatry of wealth and material well-being. He's living for the riches of this world. And he says, um, you need to divest yourself of your idolatries. What is that? It's repentance. It's turning away from the thing that is imprisoning you. Remember uh, what we confess um, when we do confession together. We, we confess to God that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. The man views himself as a free agent. Jesus is saying, no, you're not a free agent. You may think that you've kept the law since you were young, but in fact, you are idolizing your wealth. You are um, violating the ninth and 10th commandments in terms of covetousness. You need to be free of these things. This is like an intervention. Well, let me put it a different way. Every intervention for an addiction is like being called to repent and turn from our sin and, and follow Jesus. So what Jesus says is you've got to divest yourself of your addiction, your idolatry uh, of wealth, uh, and then you'll have treasure in heaven and then come and follow me. This is no different, really, what, from what Jesus said in Luke 9.23. Take a look at it again. Luke 9.23. This is a touchstone uh, passage of this gospel. Luke 9.23. Jesus says, uh, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So, what I idolize may be different from this man. Um, and so, Jesus' specific antidote will be different for me, maybe, than it is for this man. But the antidote for all is the same, and that is to turn away from what imprisons us to this dead and dying world so that we can follow Jesus into eternal life. You see how the theme is carried through now. Um, so this is the issue. Jesus is concerned about this man's eternal life. The man has this idea that eternal life is something I earn, and it's up on this wifty plane far above you know, everyday life. Jesus says, no, eternal life comes to us in the midst of everyday life in this world. Huh? And so he wants to rescue us from our imprisonment to, the, to death and to the dying things of the world. Um, now notice what happens next, verse 23. But when he, the rich man, heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. That's the first place that Luke tells you he's rich. So he's sad because he's rich. Why is he sad? Because he cannot bear to let go of his riches. Because it's what defines him. It's what he worships. 
It's what gives his life meaning. He thought he could just make a kind of side deal by behaving in certain ways with God and that God would be forced by negotiation to bring him into eternity. But Jesus only accepts absolute surrender. And this man must surrender his God. And he's sad because he realizes that he is not going to apprehend eternal life because he's not going to let go of his God. It's a tragic passage. And keep in mind, he goes away sad because he understands what Jesus is saying. He doesn't go away sad because he's confused. He understands fully what Jesus is saying. Now, you're already, you've already jumped ahead of me. You understand here. This is once more the great reversal, isn't it? Um, uh, here is a rich man who has all the advantages of this world, but as in Mary's song, the rich man is sent empty away. Take a look at that song again, the Magnificat, Luke 2. Luke 2, beginning at, uh, what is it, 45, somewhere in there? Luke 2. Excuse me. It's Luke 1. at 46. Um, just look at it real quickly. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown, shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. Now, question, does God want to send the rich away empty? No, God doesn't want to send them away empty. He wants to give them eternal life. But they... Uh, the people that Mary is describing, and this man who encounters Jesus, they are so addicted to this life and its advantages and the ease that they enjoy, that they are unwilling to part with any of it in order to have riches in heaven. Um, and I mean, it could be drugs. It could be sex. It could be whatever, whatever one's addiction is. You have to let go of it. And as AA and the other 12-step programs show us, it is a daily process, which is exactly what Jesus says in Luke 9, 23. Take up your cross and follow me daily. There is no one who is on this earth a recovered sinner. We are at best, by the grace of God, as we take up our cross and follow Jesus, recovering sinners. So you see how that works. So now Jesus, we're told uh, back in uh, Luke 18, verse 24, we're told Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? Again, this goes back to very uh, popular Jewish thought. And of course, it exists in our world today. The idea that if you are wealthy, it must be because you are particularly blessed. You must be a particularly good and righteous person. And Jesus flips that on its head. And he says it's harder for a rich man to get into the kingdom. Why? Because there are too many things that we can use to insulate ourselves from the reality of our mortality, to insulate ourselves from accountability to the world. 
You know, you can buy access to greater medical care. You can buy access, uh, even if you're stinking wealthy, to um, uh, better legal counsel or bribing public officials. And, you know, you, you get accustomed to thinking that the world is your oyster. But the point that Jesus is making is when you make the world your oyster, the world is all you get. You don't get eternal life in the bargain. If, you know, and this is what Peter is saying in 1 Peter when he says, we are strangers. We are foreigners, sojourners in a strange land. This is not our ultimate home. So don't get too comfortable. Um, so Jesus says, you know, it's so hard because... Um, uh, you you can use money and wealth as a crutch to prevent reality from seeping into your life. And so then the disciples say, then who can be saved in verse 26? Verse 27, what is impossible with men is possible with God. There's the answer to the ruler's question. It is impossible for us to do anything to save ourselves, but it's possible with God, right? It's about faith. It's about trusting in God and not in the world or the things of this world. Now, Peter, he's trying to justify himself. He says in verse 29, we're 28, we're told, and Peter said, see, we have left our homes and followed you. <laughs> we're good people. Verse 29, and he said to them, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come. In other words, we will receive blessing upon blessing upon blessing, even if we're not numbered among the wealthy. And even if we have to deal with adversities, that those who had, you know, like like the rich man in Jesus' parable of uh, Lazarus, who enjoyed all of the advantages in this world and never gave thought to anyone beyond himself. So Jesus is warning us against particularly money, but overall warning us against anything that would get in the way of our receiving eternal life. Now, immediately thereafter, Jesus uh, does, he foretells his passion for a third time in the Gospel of Luke. And what I'm going to do tonight, it's already 947, I'm going to finish up this passage at verse 34. And then we'll pick up with the rest of chapter 18 tomorrow. Verse 31. And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. You know, I'm looking at my notes here, and there's no way that I'm going to get this done in the next uh, five minutes. I don't want to go overboard. Um, I'll just point this out about this passage, and we'll come back to it tomorrow night. Uh, Jesus is very intentional about taking the 12 aside. That means that what he's about to tell them is very, very important. And they don't understand. And uh, that's a that probably is a good tantalizing cliffhanger uh, way to leave things. Hi, Judy. Sorry, I just noticed your uh, greeting there. I hope you're doing well. Um, and give me an update on your your situation as well, and we'll keep you in our prayers. You are in the prayers of our church every Sunday, by the way, Judy, just so you know that. So, um, 
So we'll pick up tomorrow night at verse 31 rather than verse 35, Lord willing. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for this time in your word. We thank you for your promises that outstrip our poor, puny capacity to do anything that even resembles righteousness. We thank you that you give us your righteousness as a gift through faith in Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that daily we would divest ourselves of our sins and idolatries and follow Jesus in the life eternal with you. Father, we pray that this message of hope, of deliverance, of redemption, of salvation and grace would be uh, carried by all of us into our everyday lives. Lord, we are not accountable for what we don't know, but we do know that Jesus is Lord and Savior and that salvation is a free gift for all who believe in him. Give us opportunities to share that wonderful good news, that eternity-changing good news. And Lord, give us the power to do so. Give us the goodwill to do so, to care about our neighbors so that they too will receive life with you. Father, uh, we pray that you would give to each of us restful nights of sleep and that tomorrow we will awaken to new possibilities of service in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I will plan, Lord willing, to be with you here tomorrow night at 9 p.m., and I look forward to it. I love this chapter. God bless. Bye now.